Would you believe it? House of Rugby has landed in Japan. Tins has come screaming through the VIP lane at Customs. The Hoff has somehow passed the rubber glove test and we are off and running. This is the world famous Shibuya crossing. Two and a half million people make this journey every day. Two and a half thousand at every change of lights. And we're kind of hoping that one or two of them are going to come to our first live show this evening. We have got so much to get through over the next three weeks. We've got live shows, podcasts. We've got a bag load of social media content and we've got a documentary to make as well. It is an absolute pleasure to be off and running in Tokyo. Joe presents the House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Ladies and gents, a very good evening to you all, and a very warm welcome to our first House of Rugby live from Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> Who'd have bloody thought it, eh? They've let us out of our box, and they've sent us abroad, and we are going for it. Um, but without further ado, um, this show doesn't happen without two absolute ledgers. Would you please give a very warm welcome to the Hoff and to Tins. Mr. James Haskin, Mr. Mike Tindall. Um, we've got a very special guest to introduce you to a little bit later on as well. We'll come to him in a moment too. But you arrived eight hours ago. Mm. You arrived seven and a half hours ago. We've had more coffee today than I think is humanly possible, plus a couple of just sharpness to get us going for tonight. How are we feeling? Um, yeah, I'm all right. It was a bit of an epic adventure. Obviously, uh, you know, I know it's no laughing matter. Obviously, the, the typhoon uh, Hagbis, or Haggis, if you want to go with that, um, <laughs> obviously, um, you know, caused a bit of devastation. I was supposed to fly out on, on, on Saturday, so uh, I had to come out Monday night, but I had to do 25 hours via Bangkok, which wasn't actually that bad. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I, listen, he, as a good he intrepid... found Pat Pong Road yeah, very I, interesting. I, 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 as an intrepid explorer, I, I ventured out, I, yeah. you know, and, and saw the sights. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, first things first, a lot of shady older white men operating around there, really giving, <laughs> really giving yeah. sort of the UK a bad name. Dropped in nicely yeah. just behind No, them. no, no, I, sort no, of, well, no, I, I can't no. really walk anymore. I kind of stick out like a sore thumb, but I haven't reached the point where I'm a middle-aged white pervert. So I was sort of, <laughs> I was sort of scratching. Actually, we've been walking around with you all day. You're, <laughs> yeah, I'm not no, sure we no, haven't reached that. I'd say you're a middle-aged white yeah. pervert. No, right. no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm no, not no. middle-aged. I'm not a pervert. I'm uh, very observant. I love that. I love Typhoon Haggis. It's the only thing that uh, Scottish that's actually caused some havoc out here. Do you know what the best bit was? Do you know what the best bit was? That obviously, the Scottish got the Scottish got so upset about the the, the, the game potentially called off. They said they were gonna they were gonna sue, which was absolute bullshit because they were never paying for anything. <laughs> they're, they're too they're too tight. They were never gonna pay. I, I, got abs I got absolutely rinsed because I threw out a tweet saying. I wonder how much the Scottish will complain if our Ireland lose their last game and they go through on the draw. Yeah. And literally, the amount of people who thought I was being serious was mm. incredible. It's like, fuck off, dickheads. Yeah. Just learn to... <laughs> let, me, let me explain something to you. Just to relax. It's called a joke. Let me explain something to you. you Sports to fans that. do not understand humour. If it's about their team, they ain't taking it. There's someone, no rationality. So, someone said to me, who do you think you are? Yeah. They all want to play. I was oh. like... Fuck off. Yeah, exactly. In a Haskell way, fumbling. fuck off, virgin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True, true. Do we have any lost jocks here this evening who are on a consolation tour? Yes, We've got one. Yes, <laughs> Welcome to you. Welcome to you. I love that you, you stayed out. Yeah. Your team. I love that you stayed out this long and were that optimistic. Yeah. Fair play. <laughs> I would have been home by now. I would have booked uh, the flight before <laughs> for the weekend, but never mind. Have we got any Welshies here tonight? Yeah. 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 
we met the, the met, absolute Roydenor and uh, and yeah, his yeah, gang. Yeah, Do you know yeah. the man with the permatan? The yeah, man that was yeah, yeah. 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 Honestly, you know you know they're Welsh. Like a, you know they're Welsh because they're a wearing full stash. Yeah. B they're tanned to an inch of their life and they're all units. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, there we are. There's the Welsh people. Uh, if you ever need a sunbed in Japan, they know exactly where they are. <laughs> <Of course they're laughs> Can Any... we just talk about the epic adventure that we've had today? Because I don't think. Can we just come back? So I want to find out. We've got the Irish in the house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sort of enthusiasm you've been playing with as well, yeah. Oh, what I love is the fact they're actually showing Japan Island on the screens behind you. Just, just basically, Tins has requested that just to yeah. troll you, sir, on your yeah. Todd here. <laughs> and have we got any England boys in the scene? Oh, yeah. Home run. We've actually got some Kiwis Yeah, what? Well, any Kiwis? Kiwis in? Yeah, we've got yeah. some. Yeah, exactly right. Wait, <laughs> right, this guy, right, this Kiwi guy. Do you know? Am I right in thinking you came. Are you, am I right in thinking you came this evening because you thought Kieran Reid was coming? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's true, isn't it? Did so you think yeah. Kieran Reid was coming? Well, no, on the... No, don't try and join in. No. Just answer <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> yes or no. Yes or no. Got, no, no. Sit like that. Yeah, Sit like that. Yeah, like that. Honestly, he's... he's that was the point in the room. He, so, so, apparently... So, first of all, they thought, they thought Kieran Reid was coming here, right? Yeah. And, obviously, if you thought Kieran Reid, he's one of the best uh, number eights ever played, credible player, but the only reason you'd get him on a podcast if it was one of those ones to put you to sleep before night. It was like <laughs> whale music or one of his stories. Dennis, but that guy in the corner is so Kiwi. Yeah. He's like, fucking hell, mate. You're fucking what you read on. I'm like, sorry, sir, Australia what are you saying? Yeah, he's like yeah. fucking full. He's, I can't understand he, a word. He's too Kiwi. He's Kiwi, not Australian. They all sound the same. Doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't matter. That. In that part of the world, doesn't matter. Just alienated the southern hemisphere from our... Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The point was, no one can understand what he's saying. It's fine. Welcome to everybody. It's very yeah. nice to have you here as part of the House of the Rugby family. You want to talk about what we've done today? Yeah, I mean, so we've arrived... This, I arrived this morning at, at, at six. Customs was a bit of a nightmare, not because I was carrying anything <laughs> dodgy. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of vibration going on in his back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, Apparently, he's away for Chloe for ten days yeah. and things have to come with him. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, oh, no, please don't search me again. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, is that only using the two fingers today, yeah. sir? I've got it. It's very far up there. <laughs> Um, no, but I, so we, so we arrived and I thought, look, I thought no way would they plan to have a live show, right, in the, in, in, in the day we land. Shock, we've got a live show. Little did I think that it would be at an Irish bar, probably the most cultural place we could find yeah. in the middle of... But, but if Rome. you're going to an Irish bar, you're thinking it's going to be an O'Malley's or something. Yeah. Not... Peter Cole. Cole. Peter Cole. Peter Cole. Peter Cole. Very That's Irish, Irish Peter, Cole. Cole. Yeah. Peter Cole. So, so, so we've turned up there and we've... And what's happened is that the producer side, who I don't know why we even bother listening to, has decided to take us on a never-ending adventure. And we've genuinely walked. We, you've got... How, how many Do you want the official count? Yeah, yeah. 22,939 steps. Today. 22, yeah. From, from our hotel to Shinjuku, Shinjuku to Shibuya. I've now got... I mean, I can't walk at the best of times. <laughs> I'm chafed, which is not great. <laughs> I've got blisters, and, we've, and I've seen more... I lived here for six months. I've seen more of Japan today <laughs> than I did the entire time. And it's our day one. We've, we're filming everything we do as we go. We're, we're building a little documentary, and the entire day one footage of Tins is you picking a box of shorts out of your butt crack. You yeah. have been chafing <laughs> since we got going this morning. Seriously. Yeah. Well, if you, I have got, got rot, rot, rot to, uh, to a whole new level. If anyone's got talcum powder, please let me know. But You've been picking your pants out, but, but we've had old shades. If you follow me on Instagram, uh, you know shades. Alex has been wearing a pair of cataract, cataract glasses <laughs> for the entire day. Because you had a few drinkies last night, didn't yeah. you? A little, yeah. feeling a bit tender. You drink no, really responsible. Just but important but to loosen really off when you arrive in a new country. I'm looking at producer side. He's basically just, just basically going to want us to start the entire show. Right. Yeah. Point. But I hope you have all had a very good yeah. start to the show. And those of you who are just joining us at this point on the podcast, away we go. Should we welcome our special guest? If anyone guests? wants to know that uh, an actual Irish back just scored, it's a really rare sight. <laughs> no one ever sees that. So uh, just Brilliant. turn around. Should we welcome our special guest? Oh, I think we yeah. should. Um, he is a ledge in both hemispheres. Ladies and gentlemen, 81 caps for the All Blacks, the victor of the British and Irish Lions. It is the one, the only. One of the best tourists, by the one way. One of the best. <laughs> <laughs> he was picked in our Tourist 15. I think yeah, he was captain. in our Tourist 15. A huge. Hoop oh, really? yeah. yeah. for Mr. Justin Marshall! <laughs> Kiwis are happy. Yeah. Well, you know, you know when we asked if there was Kiwis, there was only one. Suddenly when he gets up, there's 17 in the room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> funny that, isn't it? Well, what cracks me up, and it's great to be here, good to see you, gentlemen, oh, yeah. and everyone else, is um, when Tins put the message out about who could make it along, because there's quite a few internationals around, 
I could have sworn there'd be fucking 15 Australians in here. Former players, because he said there was free beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm surprised that there's no Australians here. Yeah. They'll, 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 they'll be on their way. There's, 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 there's two way. Gloucester fans. Do you know how they're Gloucester fans? Because they're wearing full stash <laughs> all the way <laughs> Which I assume in Gloucester fans, that's probably all they own. Which is, you know... Which... That's not what you said earlier. You, you just said they, they had six fingers, is what you said. Well, no, no, I didn't say that. They did give me a high so six, but it's fine. Um, have we got a couple who joined us from Osaka as well? Yes, we do. Have people who came Has anyone come from Osaka? Right. Yeah. You have, you've come, have you genuinely come to this yeah. from Osaka? Oh, no. Oh, no, definitely not this. No, definitely oh, not this. You just accidentally stumbled in. You're very welcome. That was great, great info from producer. Sam. Thank you very much indeed for that. We'll take the earpiece out at this point of the way we go. How's life? What's Life's happened? good. You, so you've been out, you've gone home, and you've come back. Are you feeling yep. full of beans and ready to run? Yeah, to the end look, of the I, I came out for the first round, which was which was great. I think uh, it was really entertaining. Um, I went home and went on antibiotics for a week. <laughs> uh, got my voice back. Got well, my, which got, places did you visit so we know not to, yeah, not yeah, to go back there yeah. or to go? The places in Rapongi that are still open when the sun comes up, <laughs> they are areas that I hit and they, they, they hit me really hard. So the first thing I did when I got home was go to the doctor, Good. got my shit sorted, yeah. uh, and I'm ready to go again now. Right. Yeah. What is the vibe in New Zealand? Yours to lose, or are you just sort of surveying the land and thinking, hello, I'll do one or two challenges this time around? Yeah, well, Kiwis are what they are when it comes to rugby. It's uh, pretty hard to escape it when there's really a good cup in town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're Dr. Jew, mate. This is true. <laughs> And um, well, I guess it's the business end now of the tournament, so yeah, they're, they're slightly less cocky. You, you probably don't believe me, do you? Than, than, <laughs> than normal, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we are, we are, a bit grounded. So I don't think, no, I don't I think don't it's a like, mate. The tournament is think, well set up. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think Kiwis are cocky. I don't think Kiwis are cocky. They're, don't you like, talk? But, like, then, but that's the thing is, is when when a team is so well built, like it, it like Kiwis had been for eight years before. It's not being cocky, it's just confidence in your own ability and getting the job done. And it, we, I would say we had it in 2003. Uh, it's not being cocky, whereas this year you don't quite have that stable base that you've had for eight years, do you? No. Uh, spine of a team, at what people talk about. But, um, but still, I think you're, the team, you're still going to be the team to beat at the moment. Yeah, I guess that history in the last year, if you look at the last year, hasn't been great. We've lost to South Africa, we've lost to Australia, we've lost to Ireland. Um, and, and been really pushed, so... <laughs> yeah. just so, so you know, you're looking, it's fucking awkward that you lost the Ireland. He's never been able to cross the RSC again. Yeah. He's, he's done them in the eye. Well, I said a year ago they were shit, and it proves I'm right. So who's the, who's the fucking fool, right? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think... <laughs> I would, I, I, I'm always interested about this, because I remember um, when I first played against the All Blacks, we were doing something at Twickenham, and we went upstairs afterwards, and I think it was Corey Jane and maybe Israel Dagg, and they were doing something, and, and they got asked about... Um, the opposition players, and they were, so, so what do you think of your opposite man? And it became abundantly clear that those two had no fucking idea who they'd been playing against all day. <laughs> and, and, and initially, I thought, ah, oh, to myself, uh, oh, you know, these guys, the Kiwis are arrogant, like you were saying. But actually, it's subsequently from then, I believe that they, they just worry about themselves a lot. Don't right. You just you just focus on yourself, do what you're going to do, execute your plan. Obviously, you respect the opposition, yes. but you, you you do that. And I actually I actually think, having lived in New Zealand, that. Uh, Kiwis almost have like a bit of a tall poppy syndrome. If you do start being a bit arrogant, if you do start having a bit of a personality, then everyone starts getting your back, which yeah. is actually why I think it's interesting when you look at some of the players in, in New Zealand when they finish. If you're a superstar, you're fine, but if you if you don't uh, if you finish, you don't quite make it. You don't get 100 caps. You don't win a World Cup. You kind of fade a little bit well, because. Nasty. No, 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 but I just... CV's all right. I'd say the CV's all right. I'd say the CV's all right. 85's all right, mate. I'm over it, mate. I'm over it. No, but do you know what I mean? I mean, if you'd have just made it in that... Do you know what I mean? Because it's really interesting. I thought... I'll tell you why I say that, because I saw, like, Ardy Sevilla started doing a podcast. Like, started doing a podcast on his channels and else, and getting people opening up and all this. And that, for me, is quite rare for a Kiwi to be quite spontaneous to create as an extrovert, yeah. which I think is great for sport. I think you need to do that, especially in a world where your career can finish like that. But my experience with Kiwis were they live and breathe the rugby, they worry about themselves, but if you dare come up and be, think you're bigger than the game or have too much of a personality, you're kind of shunned a little bit. Am I right in that or is that, is that wrong? Yeah, you're bang on, actually. You've got it. <laughs> it's the first sucker done I've ever said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right about that we have a genuine respect for all of the teams that, that you play against and you know there's some great individuals and some great history that are, that are in the game but yeah ultimately the focus very much is on your own rhythm 
and, and doing what you do, do doing it well and, and respecting the game. So, yeah, you've actually nailed yeah, it. Yeah, but, you, you, fire, man. yeah, but do you think that's an issue, though, for younger players? I don't want to get too serious, but I'm really interested because you see now, like, in the, in the, in the Premiership and everything else, that, you, that players are encouraged to have personalities outside of rugby. Uh, it, it wants to be... Are actively encouraged to branch out, set businesses up. Yeah. The one thing I noticed with New Zealand is, is that everybody's like the All Black shirt. Nothing's bigger than that. We're all about this. We're, we're very humble. We fit in. There's a there's a strong heritage. We play. We train. Everything's about that jersey, which is why I think you're you're so successful. Um, and obviously against amongst the very fact the Super 15 is structured the way it is, etc. But do you think there's a bit of an issue? Because because. I just think young players from New Zealand, what happens if they don't make it or they only get a couple of caps? Where do, where do they go with that? Yeah, I think it's France. Like, you get paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even then, <laughs> when, 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 what I'm saying is when the music stops and you've developed nothing else but you've all been all about rugby and been told your entire life, stay humble, that's why I'm so impressed with, like, uh, Savir and the other guys actually branching out and having their own personalities because, mm. you know, I know better than anyone, as soon as you, you've got a best laid plans, and it's taken away from you like that. Yeah. I just wonder whether in New Zealand that's something that people need to start considering a little bit. I think they do, and I think they're recognising that, like what Artie's doing. It's uh, it's bloody important to have a good balance as well. And you know, rugby's everything in New Zealand, and these players just get you know bombarded with it, particularly the top the top ones. And you're right, it can be taken away from you so quickly, and, and then there's a real struggle. So you've got to get out and be more open while it's happening and, and while you're involved in it. And I think it makes you a better person, but more grounded as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's important that the younger kids also learn to do that. But like, let's face it, when you think about it nowadays in the modern day, this will be happening all over the world, including the UK. Like these kids are basically from 14, 15 year old, uh, 15 years old, are being put into being basically mini professionals. Yeah. And they're not living like between like how much shit do we get up to between? 16, 17, and 21, 22, you know? Yeah. Like, what do you mean, between 16 and 34? Yeah. Quite a lot. <laughs> well, well, you know, you, you go out, you, 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 you drink, you have a good time, you make your mistakes, you learn, you, you, you get your balance, um, you grow, and, and, and you evolve. The, these, these guys don't get any of that because they're, they're told not to. They're told what to eat, when to eat, where to go, when to drink, when not to drink. And, and they're, not, they're not living, um, I guess, through that period where, where you do learn. And then all of a sudden they come out of it at 25 to 30 years old and there's a massive proportion of their life that's kind of out of kilter a little bit. That's the danger in the game. And because they're grabbing them, sorry, yeah, like contracting players now at 15 years yeah. old is freaky. Because also there's only so many people can go into coaching or do something else. You're fighting over, you know, kind of similar jobs. I just right, wonder... Same, same with if you're talking about media and mm. presenting. Yeah. There's only so many pundits you can have out there. Yeah. So you know, you then have to have a genuine interest in something else. And, I, I'm just, I just think it's the one, they're the one country, and I think South Africa are a little bit similar, Australia are a bit, bit different. Where I'd like to see more, more personalities yeah. in in their team. I'd like to see that because I think it's the one thing where actually they're that good, and as long as it didn't detract them doing stuff off the field and having more personality, I'd love to see it. But it seems like it's so, it's so controlled. Like yeah. you know, you never actually get access to the, the Kiwis. The very kind of that are like this myth mythical no, kind of team. Ninety percent of the Kiwi playing rugby Kiwis are fucking dull as shit. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, fortunately, we have got a, one of the ten percent here. But I mean, like some of them just don't know anything else, do they? Because of the how how you're brought up and how important rugby is. It frustrates me. Yeah, because yeah, they are they are very very focused but very insular and. Like, um, so who would take yourself for example? If you I, I was going to say, who's the Cipriani? So Cipriani, obviously, bright talent, not used by England. Who is the guy who is out there who's been brought into the All Black Fold in that regard? Who have they made the most of, despite being a bit of a, a rogue or a renegade? Um, probably in, in the in recent year would be Sebo Reese, oh, really? the yeah. winger. Yeah. He, what about Aaron Smith as well? Because he's he skated with he skated with with a few. He things. went through his, he went through a terrible patch. Didn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah. Because I, I, you know when I was in um, when I was in the Highlands with him and, and obviously watched him kind of develop and, and become an incredible player. Everyone said, what, what, what mark did you leave in New Zealand? I said, well, I taught you know Aaron Smith everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're also going to talk a bit more about the All Blacks. We're going to talk and we're going to ask how far Japan can go. And we're going to discuss. And I'm reading this, not stating it. Uh, whether Scotland are now a tier two nation. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is too easy. Um, I actually said in the speech that if they lost to Japan, they could have the independence vote because it was so embarrassing. <laughs> 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 
that we didn't want anything to do with them. Like, we just pushed, like, rebuild Hadrian's Wall and just send just, them on their way. Just cut along yeah. the dotted line. When all the oil go. runs out and they're coming back, going, please, um, can we have some more? Of, Absolutely not. What's the difference between a tier one and a tier two nation? Well, Hadrian's Wall. Hey, <laughs> lads, lads, lads. I love Scotland. <laughs> Actually, the Scottish qualified, but apparently my my Scottish clan was the one that sold out the Scots to the English, which is similar to my personality. So I thought <laughs> I would be perfectly at home, go backstabbing go arsehole. Go <laughs> um, having said all of that, it's been a phenomenal pool stage. There's been a lot of wonderful stories, but draw a line into the quarters. How excited are you about the knockouts? Well, they are what you thought they would be, apart from Japan. Japan has been the team of the tournament so far for me. I don't think anyone would disagree in terms of the games that they've played have been amazing to watch. Scotland, the Scotland game was the best game of the world. I mean, probably uh, New Zealand, South Africa to start off with was the game, but I think that just took it to a whole new level in terms of 60 million people watched it. Unbelievable. Uh, which is unbelievable. Yeah. And how good is that? But immediately throws into World Rugby, are you going to make them go into the four, uh, four, uh, four, na four nations. Someone suggested having them in the Six Nations. Okay. I thought it was a great idea. And you what? Put them in the Six Nations. <laughs> no, but what? And, and expensive in addition to? Yeah, you can, well, well, what's the point in doing that? Why don't you just have really pull that through, have you, Hask? No, I have. I don't care. Get rid of Italy, I'll say it. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my old teammate Sergio Parise is retired. I don't care. Get him in. Get him in. Get your man in. Yeah, but why don't you just add them into the four nations? Well, why don't we add them everywhere? Let's make it. <laughs> Do you think, is there a place for Japan in the rugby championship? Well, I think if their development continues to go the way that it is, um, I guess the biggest concern for them is keeping control of the foreign influence that, that they grow from within. But the, the way that they've sort of is evolved it, in Super Rugby has been good. Um, and and they're getting exited. kicked out. Of yeah, Super yeah rugby, which, is, yeah. which is wrong. Which is wrong. Um, Some will, right? Yeah, yeah but, but someone said that it's not, it, it was voluntarily. because because. After Japan beat Ireland, everyone came out and somebody tweeted saying, again, we live in a world of fake news, saying that uh, what a shame that uh, Japan of Super 15 side had been removed. So I retweeted it and then some absolute Kino came <laughs> in with the, the truth and went, no, they've, 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 the Japanese rugby union has removed them themselves. Right. Potentially, I don't know. That could be absolute fake news, but it, it wasn't a case of them being thrown out. Apparently they were voluntarily removed, so I don't know. What does that even mean? It means they went, Oh, we don't like it. It's a little bit crazy. We're going to just go back to doing our own thing. I don't think they said it like that, but, you know. <laughs> could top yeah. Would you like to see, and do you think there is scope to add Fiji and Japan to the rugby championship? Uh, You'd have to have to change the setup, wouldn't you? Yeah, you, know, you would. Yeah. One game, it'd become like Six Nations. Yeah. yeah. Home or away. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to sort of consider, and, and obviously there was the big proposal about the, the global game yeah, that yeah. they didn't really consult the players about, which was yeah. a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. that happens a lot. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> people involved but uh, I certainly think uh, the biggest issue is some of these sides are not playing with the players that they can play with that's the first thing they need to resolve world rugby they need to allow uh, they have to put pressure on clubs to allow teams to be at, at their maximum I think the biggest disappointment of the pool play for me was the Pacific Island teams yeah like Fiji you've mentioned them they were okay yeah they actually didn't play as well as what they have been playing but Samoa and Tonga you know those teams used to be you used to hate meeting them in the yeah, pool yeah. stages. I got them both World Cups in pool stages, and you're just like, holy shit, it could, anything could go, you know, really pear-shaped on the day. But they've been poor. Yeah. Like, their players aren't getting released by their European clubs. Or well, they're um, retiring a week before. Well, that's, yeah, that's but, right. But that is, that is the problem. There's only two nations in, in the... Well, pretty much two Tier 1 nations in the world that don't work on a centrally contracted basis, and that's France and England. Yeah. So a lot of the Tongans slash... Samoans end up in France, and then they don't give a shit about Tonga no. and Samoan, and so they never get them back, they never get training weekends. You know, do World Rugby put enough money back into them to allow them to do that? I'm not sure whether they do, um, but then it makes it hard if you don't have time together. I think the success of Fiji has come off the back of uh, the Olympics, um, the last Olympics in terms of what Ben Ryan did and, and changing their perspective on being professional and everything else. Yeah. Um, but how long is that going to last? I think. Again, what Justin said, they did well this year, but then frustration. It's like how they lost to Uruguay, I have no idea when they had <laughs> all that ball. They, I mean, two on one, suddenly they couldn't take. But you know, they've, but then every time against Australia and Wales, you felt they could have won that game. Yeah. But then they, but, so then they, you're like, well, we've just got to give them a little bit more and they can, they can turn this around. But are they going to get that? Because again, they'll go back to the teams that they play for because Fiji don't have 
like a, a, a Super 15 team or something else. They'll go back to France, they'll go back to England, and then you won't get them together again until they get up a I, month before the next World Cup. I actually finished um, Ben Ryan's autobiography, which is a fantastic read, by the way, anyone who wants to... To, to check it out, obviously the story of him winning the the seven seven, the seven, seven yeah, it was an amazing amazing book. And what was really interesting at the part of it, he he said um, about wanting to set up a Super Fifteen over there, but because of the political situation and everything mm. else, that was very difficult to, to do that. I, I think that you know there's a lot of speculation and, uh, about these things uh, with these teams and who should qualify. Yet when it comes to trying to force through bizarre, you know, uh, all year round systems or, or or season extensions. We seem to get through that stuff really quickly. But when we try to add new teams, it seems really complicated. When surely, just like qualifying for a World Cup, qualifying for these tiers, we should be able to qualify for these tournaments. You know, your, your world rankings, your, your situation, wherever you play, and be able to have an option to have, you know... Like, I love Italy playing Italy. They, they, you know, they're always a tough side. But, you know, if there's another team that can qualify ahead of them, put them in. You know, if it works to have Japan, you know, the rugby, the rugby championship, do that. If it, if it works to have them in the Six Nations, do that. I think the opportunity to keep growing our game is integral and we're being held back by like nonsense politics but actually I think we should be able to do do these things to help grow these games because it's great when a world, world cup but you meet fans all the time who say ah oh, you know I'm not really a club uh, 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 follower I just like international rugby and you know what I mean they're like fair weather fans they as soon as there's a world cup on they get behind their teams everyone's absolute love what Japan have done so why why don't give them opportunity everyone knows that in any team I've ever played against, the Pacific Islanders are probably the best players in that team, like without a shadow of a doubt. Yet they don't seem to be able to consistently to get it together for their nations because of internal home politics, in, in the way they're released, the way that they're treated. And actually, it showed with Fiji that when Ben Ryan brought his discipline, his approach, even though it was based around the Fijian way, he got an incredible result. They haven't been able to keep that together since, since then. So I just think if we could get a little bit of control and stop worrying about fucking season-long things and season extensions, all this other shit, and actually do what people are interested in, it might it might help. Just an idea. Vote for me. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hasn't that bloke stepped down? The no, ballots are open. Actually, you'd probably fit into a politic. I would, yeah. I've got more scandals sort of than overqualified, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If to be a politician, you need to have a deviant past, you need to be outspoken, I'm overqualified. Now, I've had more scandals than fucking any, the, the, the uh, Tory party. Hask the PM. Um, yeah. Let's make a statement then. What would you... You've got, you've got Fiji and you've got Japan, who have... I mean, I know Fiji haven't obviously over excelled, but they've got some unbelievable talent and unbelievable potential. Japan are potentially over exceeding. Promotion relegation with the rugby championship? Do they just continue what they're doing? I mean, how do we make more of the teams who are trying to fight their way to the top table? Well, again, you've, you've, you've got to be able to get the format for them to get better. And the problem with Japan at the moment is they're playing in the tournament where it is with Fiji and uh, Tonga and Samoa, and the, the quality is just not good enough. So yeah. the fact that they've, got, they've done so well in this Rugby World Cup is incredible. It's a testament to the coaching and, and their development. But Look, I, I, the, the way that the game is evolving and the way that players are getting better and teams like Japan are coming through, the biggest disappointment for, for, uh, disappointment for me out of this rugby world cup in Argentina, like, yeah. you know, they're a crackingly good side and uh, they got their team, the Haguaris got all the way to the Super Rugby final this year and really competitive, real, really good side. Their development has been through Super Rugby um, and then internationally being in the rugby championship. So. Yeah, there's some valid points in introducing Japan into that format because if they can start to emulate that, that's great. But you know, why are they why are they had such it's, a? It's funny for Argentina. So like four years ago, they were probably one of my teams of the World Cup yeah. in terms of how they played, mm. how they did. Whereas this, it, it's felt to me that this year, with them getting to Super uh, Super Rugby final, they felt that they deserved to be in the quarterfinals mm. and they deserved to be in the semis. So they turned up and played really boring, really shit rugby, mm. like pragmatic rugby. Mm. Whereas what you enjoy about watching is you, they just go and implant, the, um, imprint their style of rugby on the game, throw it, keep it alive, offload. And they've done none of it. It's been I, cause I, I thought they would get to the semis, and literally they've been the biggest disappointment for me uh, because they look like they're like, oh, we're a tier one nation now. We're going to play a controlled game, and they. But that's not what people want to watch in Argentina. They want to watch them be loose. Whether they've lost a few players that have made that difference, but it was. Oh, they, I agree with Justin. They were completely disappointed mm. this this World Cup. What about these calls? Have you heard from anyone in the England camp since we've been here? Uh, I, I, I got a message from Billy. Are you around this week? It's ominous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, 
Why are you going we? Miss Billy, what do you think worse is going to happen? We're going to eat a load of steak or overdose the sushi or something. Um, now, he... he uh, yeah, so I spoke to him and then and then uh, had a chat with Eddie. Just yeah. checking in. Yeah, it was all right. Anyone? I was like, I'm, I'm here, I'm fit. I'm absolutely not fit. <laughs> I, I couldn't run, I couldn't walk around Tokyo properly, yeah, let alone run. Yeah, was, can't. He was stumbling I ca- around I catch, Tokyo. You know, I catch sight of myself walking past, like, at a shop window. Any reflective surface, I'm basically looking at myself, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I he walk. never looks at the face, he always looks yeah. at the leg. There's a lot of that. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of Body like Baywatch, show. face like Crime Watch. Prawns. Yeah, so, and I realised I just can't walk. So I, I've had a chat with a little bit, but because we're not in Tokyo, I haven't bothered kind of trying to reach out too much to them because I want to let them get on with it. And I, I've no, been a lot. Pardon? No, they're not in Tokyo. Tokyo, yeah. Oh, God. Listen, I love the Kiwis. Oh, it's the first Lord, night out Lord. I've ever had. If you're going to come, right. make it land. Right. Do you know what the, the best out, thing is, is? They're so excited because they've seen electricity. They've had somewhere to park their horses. <laughs> <laughs> they've had somewhere to park their horses. They're fucking <laughs> loving life, honestly. Just simmer down, chap. Simmer down. Um, <laughs> how, how is it? I just want to ask you. So there have been much. I did a do the other day and with. Jamie Roberts, Brian O'Driscoll and Rob Andrew, and all three thought Wales might win the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the Welsh guys are here. <coughs> uh, I, I Wales think... win the... Is, and there's uh, also a, lot, there's a bit of momentum getting behind Ireland as well. I know what's mate, if it... <laughs> it listen, if we it have a Wales... Listen, it can 100% happen. <laughs> Wales could 100% win the World Cup. If they win the World Cup, the world as we know it will end. <laughs> the rugby world will end. <laughs> <laughs> they are good enough, they can 100% do it, but if it happens, I fucking don't think... I don't know what you'd have to do. We'd just not ever be able to speak about it again. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think we'd have to call off games. It would be unbearable. They think... We, like, everyone hates the English. We know that. You know, empire building. We're all arrogant arseholes. I understand that. I understand that, right? But if the Welsh win... It would just be non-stop choruses of bread of heaven. <laughs> Every conversation, doesn't matter what you're talking about, wherever you went, in the middle of a business meeting, talking about a financial situation, they'll somehow go, well, we, we, won, we, won, we fucking won the World Cup, didn't we? <laughs> what? What's that got to do with anything? Well, we won the World Cup, didn't we? Fuck you, mate. I'll be like, that's what, <laughs> that's what I'll be like. That's what I'll be like. So I just, I don't, I think, I think we'll have to invent a new game. Yeah. So the only people playing rugby union are the Welsh, and we'll go and play rugby, <laughs> rugby something because we just can't. If, if they win, it'll be over. It'll be over. It'll be what, over. what would be worse, Wales winning it or Ireland winning it? <laughs> um, for you, Ireland, but for the rest of us, no, Wales. No, 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 no. Well, actually, Ireland have been so bad this World Cup. <laughs> so I think Wales. I mean, the thing is with Wales, I think they have a lot more behind them that will make it possible for them to win the World Cup. I still... I, the only thing I don't like about Wales is their attack. I think everything else, they're a great... They've got a great Bad team defense. spirit, they've got everything else, but they, they can't score tries unless they do a crossfield kick of a, of a penalty advantage or they pick and go for 35 phases. But So Ireland were doing that 18 months ago and it got them to number one in the world. So, you know, I, I just think if they, they, they will win on the... They'll, they will beat France, I think, and then they'll come against South Africa, and I just don't think they'll beat them. But um, if they did, I, I have promised someone that I will go out for a, the night out on the piss after the final in a Welsh jersey. I have brought the Welsh jersey where we beat them in 2003, so uh, <laughs> at least I'm still at least I'm still going to feel good about myself if they do. But... Do, you know, do, you know, do you know what? I genuinely think though, if, if any coaching staff could do it, it'd be Warren Gatlin, Sean Edwards. Stephen Jones, John Brown, all those guys, they just, they have this knack of like coming together under pressure. They love the position of the underdogs. They love doing their things their way, keeping close ranks. Gats goes in the media, throws a few grenades out there. Sean gets them so fired up. Stephen Jones thinks very different from Rob Howley. He, you know, when, when we had him at Was, he was an incredible coach, incredible attacking coach that I felt probably should have got the Welsh, Welsh job. So it, it's one of those things where you'd like to dismiss it and go, they haven't got a chance, but there's that, in the back of your mind, like, shit, they actually could. And if that happens, I'm just going to pretend I never played rugby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going like, to do something else. Like, I've always been a fighter, you know, I've always done this, I'm not, I've always been a DJ, forget about it, I'm not doing it. From a Kiwi point of view, which is the one country you simply cannot tolerate winning a trophy if it's not New Zealand? <laughs> See, we're rolling too, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Good loaded <laughs> question, mate. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kiwi for you. You're an arsehole. Yeah. 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 Who would I tolerate not no, winning the Australia. regular World Cup? Australia would be first. Yeah, Which would be worse? Australia. England, Australia, South Africa. Who won it? 
Yeah, if they were to win it, which would hurt them. Yeah, most. probably probably the Aussies. I would really? say, if I was if I was perfectly honest, which I'm trying to be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> they've won it enough times. So yeah, yeah and, and England have had a dose as well. Um, South Africa are probably overdue. Yeah. So yeah, I'll probably say Aussie. Good. Old habits die hard. They do, don't is they? Is that the um, is the O3 story with you and Gregan true? The final scrum of the game. No. 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 Can, it's you, good story, can, you, can you give the version that, that's out there and then the, the reality? I need to know the story first. Was it on the four more years? That, that, yeah, that was Byron Keller. That was Byron Keller. Yeah, yeah. We, we both had a, um, we'll, we'll call it a mutual uh, sort of between the two of us. I'll use the word dislike of Byron. Right. And we used to talk about him quite a bit. Bearing in mind, this is not easy for me because he's a teammate of mine. Um, but I, I just hated the dickhead. So <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because he was al he was always he was always in the media saying about how he was going to have the the nine jersey was his and he was coming to get it and he was the fizzed up can of coke and he wants to get out there etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So he wasn't being overly friendly and that was the jersey I was wearing. So he didn't exactly sort of endear himself to endear you. himself yeah. to me. So. You know, I just sort of shut down and, 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 and completely sort of... And George didn't like him either. So, yeah, I, I went off uh, sort of 20... I, just after half time, I got my ribs broken. So Byron went on and, yeah, George gave him the real... When he was lying on the ground, it wasn't at his scrum, actually. And he said to him, four more years. Four more years, boys, four more years. Four more years, yeah. That's a very good line. Yeah. Did you play with players who, yes, you'd happily suit and boot and go to work with, but actually, aside from that, it was... Different car parks? No, look, it's one of those kind of misnomers, I think, to be a really successful team or successful business, or whatever it is, you need to be best friends with everyone. Uh, I think if you respect people and they respect you in a certain way, you don't you don't have to be friends with them. And I think, bizarrely, there's a lot of England teams that I went into where um, people talked about not having cliques, not having that, but there were, like, glaring, obvious cliques going on. Um, yes. And I, I was one of those weird people when, you know, there were certain people who would who would meet up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They would walk around together. They would go and have dinner together. All these players. I obviously was like, just generally unpopular with everybody. But I thought I was friends with everyone because I didn't. Apart from like, apart from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. It's honestly. Seriously, honestly, give security. one Guinness and the Kiwis are shit themselves. It's fucking <laughs> honestly simmer, simmer down, sir. Yeah. There's situations where you know I I, I always kind of uh, wanted to to. to to, to go and sit with anyone. I'd never planned anything, so yeah. I was always kind of one of those people that like, dotted around different groups. I mean, the only time I'd ever, I'd ever kind of actively be a bit of an arsehole was when it was like academy players, oh. and sometimes I pretend I didn't know their names and stuff. Uh, or, you know, I think I said before... Pretend. You know, was, yeah. you know that, no, yeah. well, a lot of the time I didn't. But, um, <laughs> you know, there was a guy at uh, Was, a fantastic player called Tom Willis, uh, Jack Willis's brother, but I, I thought his name, I, I pretend his name was Tim. So, but actually, he's still called Tim Willis to this day, which is a bit <laughs> awkward, he never corrected me, but... I think, uh, I, I just think there are some players that you look at and think, you know, what you're doing. But the people I dislike more will be in other teams. I was always quite lucky that no one was a real arsehole. Because in rugby, you've got quite a good self-policing. Yeah. That's what I don't think, that's what I've, I find very interesting about football, is that you see players like, you know, who, who cry after red car, gesticulate, push the referee, go completely mad. If you acted like that in rugby, you'd get self-policed by the senior players, you'd get self-policed by the coach. I think it's very in a different sport like football where there, there's players earning more than the manager, and the manager comes on TV and says, "I didn't see it," and you know, you know, he can't bollock him because the bloke will just go, "Well, fuck you, I'm not playing anymore." Yeah. In rugby, you don't you don't have that, so it's kind of quite a nice thing. You don't get too much dickhead behaviour, and if you you know, if I got tackled and I did this massive ridiculous dive, which would be quite impressive because I've got the skills to fake dive, <laughs> let alone normally dive. Um, I think someone would call me in, there'd be a meeting, a whole meeting about it, with a, a, a clip of it on the video going, Hass, do you want to tell the lads what the fuck you're doing here? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'd probably have to wear a T-shirt with I'm a fucking fanny on it or something like that, you know, for, for, for weeks, yeah. There's a new T-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a fucking fanny, yeah. <coughs> Is there anyone from 03 who you haven't seen since 03? <coughs> Stuart Abbott. Because nobody, nobody's abroad? seen Stuart Abbott, though. Nobody's seen Stuart Abbott. Is that because well, he he's, lived abroad? Or? Yeah, he's back in SA, so no one's, no one's seen him. Dan Luger disappeared for a bit, but you see him occasionally. But are there people who you've actively not seen as no. opposed to? No. So actually, as a group, you were quite yeah, a tight yeah. bunch. Yeah. But we, uh, at the time, I, uh, the Bath team that I was playing in, we weren't doing particularly well. 
as you would know, because you're a complete stato Norse those two years leading up. So I actually quite enjoy, we enjoyed going to England at that point because you're going to a team that's winning and a team with a great group, like diverse group of people from age range to experience range, and you're sort of always learning. I was a young kid, so no, I think everyone still gets on really well from that team. So interesting. The all once and all back sort of always and all back is is there more friction because of the talent and because of the success that comes or is does this sort of ring true that actually it's, it's only one or two that yeah um, um, well, Barry Keller's probably the, the exception, <laughs> <laughs> exception over 110 years can you believe it no but the good thing with the All Blacks is uh, that all, all, of, all of the decades roll into one and, and uh, every year they have a, an All Black dinner where all generations are invited and uh, I was, I was, this is terrible because I can't remember the guy's name his first name was Jack but he, he was 92 years old, and I was having a beer with him at the All Black reunion dinner. Really? And he, yeah, he played he played halfback way back in the day. And um, you know, nobody's uh, nobody's got any agenda. It's just the group of guys that have all played for the All Blacks, all at different stages. Some of them went on boats to go away for six months on tours, and you sit down and you have a beer, and it's only All Blacks. Yeah. So there's no there's no administrators. It's just a room full of players that are are all brought together and. Um, everybody, nobody's got, there's no egos, it's just a good night out and, and I think that's what the game's about. So the no dickheads policy is a thing in your backs? <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, it's important though, like, if you've, if you've got a dickhead in, in your team, it's just annoying, you know, for yeah. everybody. So, you know, like, no, nobody's, as Hask was saying earlier, no, nobody's bigger than what the game is and, and what you're trying to do in the jersey. Yeah. And, and if somebody's being that way inclined, then you're better off without them. I think if you've got if you've got strong, you know, everyone talks about kind of uh, uh, teams and having like strong coaches and strong senior leaders. The most successful teams have got guys at every single tier. So you've got the, you've got a guy who would be the young lads who would, who would who would chivvy them along the next tier up. You've kind of got the guys who've got twenty to thirty caps who will be setting their standards, and you've got the guys after that who are kind of self policing all the time. What I'm really interested actually to, to ask you, Justin, is because you've gone and done uh, the media uh, outside of of, of of the All Blacks, you left, very successful career, gone and done that, and obviously had to to commentate. How have you found the reaction of, of your former teammates or people that you were played with or known? You, you know, because you have to be honest sometimes. Yeah, you do. And, and, and also because you're not in the mould of a normal Kiwi, as I said, a lot of guys, you know, Murray Mexted and, and who was the other dude? Um, Craig Dowd. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. Jeff the, Wilson. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The, the commentators, they always used to do a Super 15. Murray Mexted and... Ron Lisbeth. Yeah. They, was obviously, yeah ex, ex, they had the monopoly for ages. And yeah, then yeah. you've kind of come out of there because, like we talked about, there aren't a lot of Kiwis who want to go in media or could cut it or had the chat to be able to do it. You've kind of put yourself out there. So how is it for working with players or doing stuff? And how are you received for a, for a nation that doesn't ever want to have too much of a personality talk. Are you received well? Do you, do you enjoy it? Do you find it a bit hard sometimes? Is it, is it difficult? Oh, just... Yeah, there's, there's, a certain, there's a certain... Uh, and there always is. We, we know this when you play, that you're going to get a group of people or a certain element that don't like what you do and don't like your style, and that's fine. Like, I, I know that as a player, that, that, that I always had that. So getting it in the media is nothing new. But what, what, what was really important to me was making sure that I was honest in, in, in my work and if, I think if you're honest that the players respect that like at, at the end of the day as long as you're not over the top brutally critical telling saying someone's an absolute twat and you shouldn't be out there mm -hmm. you just say the way it is you know yeah. and it doesn't usually make a mistake like that the players have been okay um, I, I made an effort to go in and, and uh, go to training runs and, and sort of talk make sure that you know what you're talking about is really important because try and stay up because a lot of people don't do that. That's, that's what I always found very interesting about when, when Stuart Lancaster was coach of England. He actively encouraged the media to come in yeah. because there was a big uh, there's a big disconnect in the British media where they build a side up, you see it in every single sport, and then as soon as they implode or fail, everyone brings the knives out. There's journalists that have never, ever written about that particular subject suddenly putting the knife in. We were talking about one of them today, we won't mention his name. And um, I, I, I always find it amazing. And what Stuart Lancaster tried to do was create almost a relationship with the media, invite people in. But there were some people who were the most poison tongue, the most vicious, who never attended a session, have not watched rugby for, for ages, and don't know what they're talking about, and are just seeing it from an outside perspective. And I think, as a player, you, you'd rather them come down, watch yeah. a session, understand what you're, trying understand what you're about trying to achieve, yeah. even if you don't achieve it, and try and have a level-headed level thing. But as a player, you kind of expect 
the people who have been full-time journalists and pundits not to have any level-headed. They're saying things to be controversial. I just wondered, as a, as a player, sort of poacher turned gamekeeper, I, I see that sometimes when ex-players go really hard, go, well, you know, that's appalling. It's like, hold on a minute. When you played, did you ever intentionally make a mistake? Did you ever intentionally give a yellow card away? It wasn't you, appalling. No, no it was just answer, a mistake. No, it was a mistake. And the whole yeah. is, the game of rugby would not flow if people didn't miss a tackle, and, didn't throw a pass. And realistically, if you're playing international rugby, you're not a bad player. You might have a bad game, but you're not a bad player. So it's, yeah. it's finding that balance between not going, it's terrible every game, just to, you know, he's not had his usual game or whatever. I mean, it's just, balance is the key, I think. And, yeah, I, I, I couldn't but I went in and spent a day with the All Blacks and you've just, you're have just you not far out of the game, so you'll know this well, but we're a little bit further out of the game than others, Tins, you and I, me more well, so you than are. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a dinosaur, let's, I might as well just say that. But Out of a hairline, though, yeah. compared to me and fucking Tins. Yeah. Like, you're all right. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> when, you, when your head's that big, you need it. <laughs> There's a lot uh, of hair covering it. I, I couldn't believe how much the game had changed. So I, I retired in 2010, so I went and spent a, a day with them last year. And the attention to detail was incredible. To, to, compared to what we used to, we used to do, they, they went, because I went to the whole day, so right through all the meetings. And I could not believe that when they were talking defence, Wayne Smith was up talking defence, and uh, they said, oh, this here, you made the tackle. And back in the day, it was like, great, you made the tackle. But they were talking about the next arriving player, well, could you see the ball? Yes, I could see the ball, so why didn't you target the ball? And then they're talking the third arriving player and what he's doing. And I was just like sitting there thinking, holy moly. And then went to training and they had three TV screens set up. And if the ball got dropped a couple of times, they all crowd around the TV screen. Like you used to be able to go to training runs back in the day, and this is with the All Blacks, you'd be hung over early in the week. And you, could hide it, you could hide around in the background, the rest of your teammates would cover you up. There are cameras, yeah, but you know the GoPros got, everywhere now. Yeah, like, it's just that, they've, got, they've now got drones, yeah. Yeah. so they now fly the drones over the top of training. So not only have you got three views, and we got we've got physios who are holding cameras at scrum sessions and ruck sessions running around. You've got um, uh, the coaches wearing GoPros, and you've got drones flying over the top of it. So you've got the full picture. So if you're having a cigar on the side, <laughs> you know, going, and, and my favourite thing is that going, go on, Lance, you chase really hard. <laughs> yeah, you've got a big one to. You can't get away with any of that anymore. Uh, but, and, but, and the GPS as well. Oh, my God. So if you're, if you're pissing around, it comes up on your GPS but, and you've done nothing. But it is amazing. So you stand at the end of the session, you just throw it into each other. But it is yeah. amazing that, that exactly what you've said. Is you, you've gone in to have a look at a session, and yet so many of the fans and, and the media base so much stuff on uh, assumption and what they haven't seen. And, yeah. the, uh, and the very, very fact that... You know that they talk about the barbarians and, and the old all blacks and everything else like that. When a bloke, you stand at 10, do a dummy switch, dummy switch, dummy switch, dummy switch to the winger and score in the corner. Everyone's like, great flowing rugby. Now there's 14 men on their feet at any one time. It's so organised. It's everyone wants, we want a more exciting game. It's like, well, the fucking, everyone knows exactly what they're doing at all times. Yeah. And they're as fit as everyone, as big as everyone. And it's this weird kind of, I think, dislocation between the reality of what rugby is now to what. The, the people who write about it and what the fans believe it to be, they reckon, oh, we want this real flowing game. There isn't any fucking space on the field unless you, unless you go direct, 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 suck players in, get people off their feet and then suddenly play. Otherwise, you go one off runner, <coughs> one tackler, one runner, one tackler, one runner. Yeah, yeah. You, you're there for half an hour going nowhere. Speed of rock, isn't it? Yeah. We're going to take a quick break in a moment. So just a couple of quick questions before we do. If New Zealand don't win this time, will there be an element of, we've won the last two, there was a transition game here, or will they go for the players perhaps as they have done in, when you were playing? Yeah, I, th I don't think it'll be catastrophic. I, I think uh, there's, there's a, at the moment, there's a changing of the guard happening with Hanson going out. A lot of the players who have been to two Rugby World Cups will be finishing up. So there's going to be a reboot anyway. Yeah. So there's going to be a, a, an opportunity for the game to, to change. Um, but I, I, hand on heart, I, 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 don't, I don't see an issue with a team who probably hasn't had the Rugby World Cup yeah. uh, before winning it? It's good for the game. Yeah. It's brilliant for the game. I think you know, in 2003 it was we, we had a pretty good side and and, and um, we got guilty of looking a game ahead. We were, we were, we were knew we were going to meet these blokes because they were good. So we and we beat Australia by 50 points um, in Sydney prior to the Rugby World Cup. We knew we were a better side than them and, and they just came out and, and knocked us over. But I thought it was great for rugby that England won that Rugby World Cup and I think the game. In, in, in the UK needed it. Yeah. And then, good for Tins' bank balance. Yeah, there's a few knighthoods yeah. coming out of that, yeah. wasn't yeah. there? Yeah. 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 
<laughs> access he got, areas he got a princess out of it. <laughs> 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 do you think you'd have married Zara if you hadn't won that final? Or do you yeah. think Zara would have married you? No, she chased me for a long time. Nah, he, would have <laughs> he, would, he would have married Daniela Westbrook or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if England don't win the, the fight, if England don't win it this time around, are the media understand? They've been quite under the radar, haven't they? Yeah, I certainly think, compared no, to I think, I World think, Cups sorry. past, where perhaps it's gone a little more lively. But I, th I think I think it's similar to where the All Blacks are and the fact that they've had those games where they have just sort of self-imploded. So on their day, they are a brilliant team. We know they are a brilliant team, but there is that little bit of doubt in there. So I think if that turned up, then I don't think they'd get rinsed for it. Um, I disagree. they get rinsed. Do you think? Yeah. Well, the media, the media would go hard at them. The media go hard at everybody. They've picked holes in it. They go after Eddie for all the chat he's given to them and everything else like that. Be, there's people waiting. That's what the British media do. I don't... I, do you the hate is, the media that No, much? no, no. I don't hate them. I just think... That's what I was trying to say about Stuart. I think you've got to understand that they are what they are and they're never going to change. And they have a job and what they do is to, to be sensationalist, is to sell papers, is to have an opinion. There is no point... So there is no point being a rugby pundit. Look, I think there's two extremes. There's rugby pundits that I despise who will literally go... Uh, you know, what an idiot, terrible, and just say controversial stuff, because that's like, what they like do. Who? I'm not going to name names. Sure, no, 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 you know, then you've got the flip-flop... I said we've got the flip-floppers who one week are like, Ackford. we need these people, we need these people, <laughs> you know, we that. need these people, this is what we're going to do, and then next week they're like, oh, we don't need that person. But then you've got the, the rest of the media that, that once you understand the beast, don't fight against it, don't befriend it, don't go against it, just be understand that it's a business. And that's what we've talked about before, about the media. You said the Saracens guys were probably <laughs> the nicest, best kind of media cooperative people. I just think, look, as a player, you've got to see it as a game. It's a PR exercise for you. They've got to film column inches. You've got to be clever without... You've got to give them something by having a personality, but don't give them too much. Like, this week, I, I, I write a column for a paper, I won't mention their name. They wanted to talk all about Michael Checker. I was lucky enough to work with him. I gave an honest appraisal of what I think it is to work with him. But I didn't say anything because in 2015, I walked onto the field. I was, I was like, travelling reserve for the Australia <laughs> game. Great work. Um, and I just finished warming up and I went over to Checker and I said, how are you, how are you coaching? He, he was like, mate, that fucking Ben Morgan's written our fucking pre-match speech saying about, you know, I want the Australians to relive the fucking Twickenham nightmare. And they pumped us. And so Michael Checker likes to be the underdog, likes to have that. So once you understand who you're dealing with and what, what, what teams are going to thrive on it, you know, you know Gatlin's going to come out. It's a business. But where people get really upset is if England lose, the media will knife everybody. But we all know that, but don't be surprised about it. What upsets me is where it's people knife on irrelevant facts. Like in 2015, the England team got done for not being the fittest team in the world. I know Eddie said it. We were the fittest we have ever been. We were training at altitude. The problem was, all we did was fitness. The idea was we would do fitness and then we would run a line-out move. We're still waiting to this day to complete that line-out move because we were so sh shattered that, that I think... I don't know who was hooker at the time, but he couldn't... I think Tom Young, he, he was so tired he couldn't throw the ball in. They couldn't lift him, couldn't catch. We couldn't do it. And what would happen is we'd fuck it up and then just go back to conditioning. We, we never finished it. And that was the point, is that rugby in the World Cup did not go to that long ball in playtime. So our fitness became irrelevant. It was about the most ruthless team, the team that was going to be selected to win, and it didn't work. But everyone just came out, cheap seats. They're not fit. They're not organised. That was bullshit. But we all ran with it. Everyone believed it. Clive Woodward piped up. Eddie piped up. Fuck do they know? They were, you know, they were sipping margaritas, eating prawn sandwiches. They wouldn't know. <laughs> I love you, Eddie. Apologise, but just say, you know, just still just about, say, yeah, still 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 about more selection. Yeah, I'm absolutely not. Can't play anymore. But I'd like to be team manager on a lot of money. Let you know that. <laughs> Is that the same with the Kiwi Press? That you sort of rank it from the clickbaiters to the? Well, I was going to, I was going to ask you guys actually because a big part of the fallout is expectation. So, do you, do you? Is the expectation in England that this team has shown enough form and is good enough to win it? The problem with the All Blacks is, and I, 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 I again don't mean to be arrogant, but they often enter into Rugby World Cups as favourites. So if they fail, yeah. there is a massive fallout. There always is. But I would suggest in England's case, they are one of the teams capable of winning it, but they are not overwhelming favourites. So I would imagine the fallout wouldn't be, you know, real yeah, bad. I, I think I think it's well open documented this this World Cup is there are six teams that could on any given day could beat each other so I, I do think there's a bit of leeway for every team out there in this World Cup I think there are for me it's always been between England New Zealand and South Africa in my in my head um, but mm -hmm. and I and I do believe that the 
the England New Zealand game will probably produce the winner of, of the Rugby World Cup. So, but there are still South Africa could beat anyone on their day. Wales could beat could bore every, anyone to death on their, their day. <laughs> Thanks for coming, our friends. In the corner. <laughs> Ireland. Yeah, but and that's why there's been three teams at the top of the rank, four teams at the top of the rankings in the last 12 months or whatever. So. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a massive amount of pressure, but I do think our, what Haskey's getting at is our media are quite sensationalised in what they report, and mainly it's headline writing rather than actually what's in the pieces. But um, I don't think England. I don't think as long as they perform and they might lose in a tie, or it'll be more if they don't perform that they'll get. I, I think as well we don't have a lot of, of necessary rationality around it. So 2015, we'd never beaten a, a Southern Hemisphere side consistently. Yeah. But we had a big launch at the O2. We had take that on stage. We had all this kind gold of big, ticker tape. gold ticker tape. We had all this kind of big hype and, and, and English uh, rugby fans. So we went on for however many years, about the 66 World Cup. In 2003, we won another World Cup. So we were kind of happy about that. But everyone just kind of gets, you saw it with the football last time in the World Cup. You know, everyone says it's coming home, it's coming home, it's coming home. And then it didn't come home. Um, and, and the thing is, is that actually this time, bizarrely, I haven't been in the UK for the entire time but we seem to have been a bit more level-headed, yeah. which is not normally what we do. So yeah. I, I think if we lost and there was a, an issue and we, didn't, we got beat by Australia, I think there would be a, a really negative fallout. But I'd like to say that the fans yeah. and the people in the, in the UK at the moment seem to be of the opinion that there are teams in it, but we've got a good chance, but we're doing yes. okay. Yeah. Whereas normally, we just go completely fucking mad. We're gonna win it, come on, and then we lose. They're like, you guys are shit. <laughs> we, should, we should never play again. Cut his legs off. It's like, really, Stan? From, you know, at Joe Bloggs 23 on Twitter? I think I need my legs, but at, no. uh, <laughs> at, I think if they lost to Australia, they would get abused. Yeah. Because of history of where we are in the last three years in terms of how we beat them. If we get to a semi-final and we play against New Zealand and we lose in a tight game, I don't think there's going to be... I don't think there's going to be that much hang up on it, um, but yeah, if we, I think if we went out this Saturday, then there would there would be, and, and rightly so, because we, you know, I think in the past three years, I, I don't think Australia have beaten us. I think you would know because you're a rugby nose. So um, <laughs> double check and come back post the break. I think time for a pit stop. Time for a refill. Time for a pit yeah, stop. Time for a refill. Uh, definitely time for a refill. Uh, just to remind you, you're watching and listening to a live version of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness here in Tokyo. In the company of former England captain Mike Temple, former All Black captain Justin Marshall, former Marlow under 10s no. captain James Wasps Haskell. captain. Former Wasps and, captain and, James and, Haskell! And Dark Mask. And Maidenhead under 15 most improved player. Very good uh, indeed. indeed. And what? <laughs> No, I was just saying that. And shut up, ask. Um, we're going to talk quarter kind of fun. You're going already, are you? I'm going, I'm going. Thanks for waiting. We're going to talk quarter fun. And that's how he walks, people. I'm going to piss myself. Uh, we've also got two more lives. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this. Sorry, and then everyone's, everyone's gone. Everyone's got a bunch. Pray silence, please. We've got two more live shows the 22nd and the 29th. Peter Cole's Irish Bar. Uh, in Shibuyuko. Details on the Facebook page. 7 o'clock for a 7.30 start. We're a podcast and a YouTube show available every Wednesday. Uh, now here's the former NBA star John Amici with news about a brand new show on Joe. See you in a minute or two. My day job is helping businesses thrive through disruption. This show is not about business. It's about people who go from nothing, a seed of an idea, something that everybody thinks is completely impossible, and build it into this massive, massive, massive business. There are a thousand different ways to be a huge success. One of the most interesting things that we're learning is that how people are failing is almost as important as how they succeed. In fact, it's integral. It's business. Pioneers is having really honest conversations with people, talking about their business, their objectives, their purpose, whether they're just out to make a ton of money and then quit, or whether they really want to change the world. Pioneers on Joe. Listen to it. Download it. Watch it. I had nothing profound to say. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Off we go. Part two, ladies and gents. That is John Amici and the new series of Pioneers, which is out on Thursday. Welcome back to our show here at Peter Cole's Bar in Shibuka. We've got the legend is Marshy! Yeah. And Ask and Tins! Yeah. Um, we're going to do a perfect pour, which at the moment is dry, but we're going to sort of see where we end up. It could be, it could be interesting. We're going to look ahead at all the quarterfinals as well, but first of all, um, just a word on Japan. How important that Japan have made it through to the quarterfinals and therefore leaving England 2015 as the only 
host nation <laughs> never get out of the World Cup pools. It's, it's, ama it's amazing but, and fully deserved. You know, in 2015, they, they're the first team to, they were the first team to win three pool matches and not go through. Yeah. Um, so they fully deserved it. And, you know, it was even better that they put the game on and the game was what it turned out to be against Scotland and they fully deserved to go through. Another bonus point, three bonus points in their game. So um, I think it's amazing. 60 million people we talked about earlier watched that game. And it's just going to go, obviously, they're up against the, uh, up against it, against Africa on the weekend. But, um, Joseph is saying he expects them to go on and win it, which is amazing. I, like, I don't think any of us in here actually believe that had happened, but if they could turn South Africa over again, it would just be superb. I mean, they've just been the best team to watch. And, and at the end of the day, I like watching the best rugby, and they just play possession ball, fast pace, don't kick the ball, and have control over it. And then they've got players that are setting, the thing, uh, setting fields alight, and I, I just love watching them. You spoke, did you speak to Jamie Joseph this week? No, I, I emailed him after they beat Ireland, just wishing... He wish doesn't have it. his number, so he had to email him. <laughs> 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 really good friends, uh, mates, actually, mates. Actually, actually, I, actually I, I WhatsApped him and emailed him at the same time. <laughs> and he ignored both. No, really. that's where you're wrong, actually. <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, yeah, he, he replied saying, thanks, mate. Uh, I'm waiting to meet you in Japan with my gloves on. Because everyone's obviously heard about the MMA thing. I think he's another one in the line who wants to knock me out. But he's the size of his hands and how he used to play. One punch from them big dick mitts and my head would fall straight <laughs> off. So, so um, I, I don't, I've got no interest in fighting. But he's, uh, I'm so pleased with him because he's, he's, um, he's awesome. You know, he, He's a guy that's a master tactician. I think the breakdown work, we were talking about it off air. He spent so much time with his his sides, the one that won the the, uh, the Super 15 my year, working retired, you know, tireless on the breakdown. And actually, it was interesting the year that he he got all those kind of superstar players. They he, they didn't react very well to his like constant need for contact, breakdown, intensity, violence around that. And actually, I think with this Japan side, you would have seen on social media that they they had his coaches in two, two guys from. Um, New Zealand Fight and Fitness based in Dunedin. I think they flew them out here. I think they flew the Japan guys to New Zealand and were working so heavily on their breakdown, their, their kind of contact area, wrestling, jujitsu based stuff to, to really get them in an aggressive mindset. And because, you know, the, the, I don't know if you saw in the papers, but the, the, uh, the kind of Japanese head of analysis was an English guy that, that Jamie Joseph flew over. And, and he said the one difference with them and the other team was that they're, they're more, they were doing more is better. You know, the, the whole work, work ethic was incredible. If you combine that, combine that with Jamie's tactical now, so his ability to really, really work on those key areas and drill them to the inch of their ground, I think that's why they've been so successful. And, and I would love them to, I mean, I want England to win, but I would love them, in, you know, to watch Japan go on and win the, the World Cup because that would just be <laughs> the greatest thing ever. And uh, I think, you know, if any coach deserves it, Jamie Joseph, and there's probably two or three coaches that I would have followed around the world to try and play yeah. in other teams. Michael Check, Eddie Jones and, and uh, you know, Jamie Joseph are guys that I've absolutely loved working with. Did you, you just missed him with the All Blacks, but you would have, is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah he, he after 95, yeah. yeah, he finished, but you I, I played against, against him. him. Yeah. 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 Memories? He, the first time I ever played him, he, um, he got sent off. He jumped on my hand. Did he? Stood on my wrist like that, <laughs> boom, yeah. Kieran, Kieran Bracken used to have a beer over that. Yeah, he really. <laughs> Kieran's foot off in. Uh, he's a tough. Country. He's a tough bastard, you know. Like he, he played the game, probably like he coaches, you know, very physical. Uh, he ne never sort of died wondering when he went to a breakdown, and he hated backs. So <laughs> 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 if you're a back and you're in his radar, he's very smart got as well, though. And he's very smart. He wasn't. He's not like your typical like Neanderthal uh, kind of forward. He played this. Not like you. Not like me. He's like a master tactician, but he's very clever and very cerebral. And one of the best things about him and why. I think I react well to him, to Eddie, and to Michael Checker work. They had the real uh, balance between knowing how they wanted to coach a player, but also the psychological aspect of it. And he's another one that kind of put a lot of attention to detail into his players, created a really important culture at the Highlanders, something that out of all the teams I ever played with, probably had the best culture uh, and was kind of a real taste for, for that Kiwi mentality, but also a bit more cosmopolitan as well. You know, it wasn't just out and out, uh, you know, we believe in the shirt, we do this. He wanted characters, he wanted people to lead in a certain way. As characters in New Zealand rugby, though, are you no. surprised often at those that come through to coach? Like Gatland as a hooker with Waikato. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily have thought was going to go on and become a, a multiple Grand Slam winner, a World Cup semi-final. So Jamie Joseph, likewise. Yeah. Would you ever have mapped him as someone who would 
take a country like Japan and put them into the quarterfinals of the World Cup for the first time? Uh, uh, not really, but again, you know, a, 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 somebody's personality can be infectious around the right coaching group. Yeah. And I think if you've got somebody that's really driven and motivated, you know, like Gats or like Jamie Joseph, um, even Steve Hansen to a degree, you know, yeah. like th th they, they, at the time, they probably don't think that they have coaching qualities, but they, they basically resonate with the game, they resonate with the players, and they also then get people around them that help, you know, their strengths come out. And yeah. I think that's certainly been the, like Tony Brown has been a big part of what well, Jamie Joseph. Talk us through Tony Brown. Character, man, coach, player. Yeah, yeah, great. great. I played a lot of rugby um, with Brownie and he, he's just a driven, determined individual, you know, and uh, probably wasn't the most talented. Like, when you think of the mix that he was in, he was in around when Dan Carter and Andrew Mertens were there and Carlos Spencer. So he still managed to accumulate tests in that period, which is yeah. testament to his drive. But he's just a competitive person. Um, you know, he, he, he loves the game. He loves... He's a very lateral thinker of it. A lot of the, you would have experienced that with, mm. you know, a lot of the innovations that he brings in and the things that he comes up with are incredible. Like they are, he, he would be very close to Wayne Smith, I reckon, really? in terms of being able to, on attack, create and think about things that others would never ever go in that zone with. But that's interesting, isn't it? Sorry. Uh, I, th no, I do think it's interesting because not necessarily do your best players become your best coaches because they don't necessarily understand the sacrifices or like you could rock up and you, you can be brilliant at something. I know that uh, I, spoke to, I once met Michael Phelps, uh, yeah. swimmer, and I was like, oh, you're doing a bit of coaching. He's like, no, I can't coach now. I'm like, well, why not? He said, well, I, coached this, I tried to start coaching this kid. And I said, basically, you need to do a, I don't understand this, is swimming, a six kick butterfly um, like ratio thing. The guy's like, I can only do five. What? How do I do six? And he went, Well, I don't know. I just did six. <laughs> and so and he, couldn't, ex over, he yeah. couldn't explain it. And a lot of the times, the guys who are so who are at the top of their game can't necessarily explain why they can do what they can do. Whereas the people who have had to work around these guys who who don't fi can't figure it out, they spend a lot of time figuring out where their where their flaws are. How, what are they missing? How could they possibly maximise their potential, which then they can pass on to people in that way? And I, I think you know, you talk about hookers. Most hookers are frustrated backs, or they want they want to be able to do more. Yeah. Well, realistically, they can't. They're just fat and overweight, and, they, and, they, <laughs> and that's it. They can hit people, so they're always inter interested about. I know I could, I want to do more, but I can't. But they then go away and they study the game, and they and they actually expand what their knowledge base is, and actually have a passion for learning that side of it. So when we did the, we did the show the other day with Jerry Flannery. And what was extraordinary about it off the back of it, you, you talk very eloquently about the game and you see it in a, much, in a much broader fashion, I think, than many people would expect. And Jerry's question to you once we finished filming was, why on earth are you not doing more coaching? And the answer to that is... There's no well, money in coaching. <laughs> There's no money in coaching. Well, I love how I can throw my voice. But yeah. it, it gets in the way of um, a weekend about what, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm fucked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, next question. <laughs> you've, you've done it, mate. Yeah, I've done it. Let's yeah, move on. Why are you not doing more coaching? Uh, uh, because I like weekends and I like spending time I like time weekend about more. It's the answer. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, in stop. a rough, roundabout way. I, would you, I, If somebody came in with a really <coughs> tempting offer, or I suppose flip that around, what would be the offer that would get you back into it? Um, if someone I, said, right, look, this I, team, this role, start tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know actually what it looked like because it's very. If it started off with an in individual roles in terms of centres and bits and pieces like that, I'd love to pick apart bits and pieces like that. Um, but then, obviously, being coaching and I did it for two years. It is so full on. It's you have to throw your whole life into it, and then financially at the moment, it's not quite where it should be for if you're a backs coach or whatever. Um, and this sounds really bad if I said it, unless you, unless you need to do it. Whereas, uh, you know, I did two years of it, loved it. I had a good year and a bad year, saw both sides of it, and then wanted a, a year away from it. And in that year away, I realised that I didn't have to work as hard as I did when I was coaching to get a, a bit more and a, a better life. And after 17 years of professional rugby, it was, um, 
I was like, well, I actually want to be able to, if a mate rings me up and go, let's go for a beer, or right, we're on this weekend, do you want to go away, or let's do a quick... I wanted that side of it. I hadn't had it for 17 years, yeah. since I was 18 years old. So it was selfish in some, in some ways, but I'm not upset about that. I actually want a bit of time on my own, and then I hope that at some point I will get dragged back in, but it's not quite yet. Is it, is it what they... Uh, I don't know this. I'm only looking from the exterior. Is, is that kind of what happened with Jono? That... Great, great player, great guy, awesome captain, and England suspected that he would make a great coach. Threw him a truckload of money it and was, said... It, it was difficult. Look, with Jono, he, like, he came in and he took that job, obviously, in 2008, he came in. And at the start, like, Jono was always this character that everyone would look up to, yeah. uh, myself included. But I'd also played with him, so I'd seen it on a match day in the changing room, I'd seen everything that he could give and what he could do on the field. Whereas when he came in in 2008, a lot of the guys, you know, your Danny Cares and these, they hadn't, they hadn't played with him, they hadn't seen it. They, they, they'd heard the legends of him and what he could do. And he was really bad at sharing experiences and sharing, he was quite cold in, in some way, if that, if that makes sense. Then we spent three years and this guy, Gerard, remember Gerard? Like, as Say much, something, do something, mate. As, as much as... <laughs> sorry, Mr. Gerard. So Gerard was like a... He was like a social... He, uh, he was basically a, a team psychologist. A team psychologist. But little whiskey face, you know, like, you know, like, right, guys, don't fucking... He can't deal with everything in humour. And everyone's like laughing and like that. He'd be like, say something, do something. Guys, guys. We call him the flaming galah. Uh, um, <laughs> but... Within that, he sort of opened Jono up. And then in 2011, we started getting a bit more out of Jono. I felt we got a bit more out of it. We might have let him down in a World Cup, but... Um, might, might have. Might, might have, have. yeah. yeah. Um, might have. But he, like, in, in that sort of Six Nations, obviously, we, we lost the Grand Slam game to Ireland. But he, like, Jono was sort of opening, I felt, Hass might disagree, but I felt he was opening up more and... Obviously, then the 2011, and to sum Jono up, he sort of threw himself on the sword and said, that's mm. my fault. I'll, I'll. And at that point, the, the RFU should have gone, well, hang on, no, he, he's quite prepared to throw himself on the sword. There's, there's something still about Jono, and I think his knowledge of the game, and I think he got so burnt by that. And uh, yeah, Do you think he, he should have stayed on? I would have liked to him stay on, because I thought Did we were getting more. you say that to him? Uh, I sort of was in a really weird space with him right there, uh, after 2011. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, in that, I'm in that space but I've still, said, yeah. I've, I've, I've said it, I've, I've always said it since. You know, it, was, it, it will always be one of my biggest sort of regrets. Is that I, the, the more, not because of what happened, but the more that I sort of let this captain that I'd followed for, uh, you know, well, since, since, two, since, since 2002, 2001, um, I felt that they let him down. I've got a more simpler reason why he wasn't successful. Go on. So, if, if, if Jono had come in and cleaned out all the coaches yeah, that yeah. had been existing, cleaned out everything and done things his way, it would have been great. He was far too loyal, he kept the same people, and the same people with the same attitudes, same coaching, and he just sat at the top of it. And the problem was, is that it's the same thing, and I've said it a million times about Eddie and the reason he's successful, and why the coaches haven't been successful, it is the balance of people in that team. Marty Johnson was an incredible leader. He's the only person I've ever met when I met him. It was like uh, Joe Worsley introduced me to him when I was like, 18, 19. And for once in my life, I was lost for words. I like massively overcompensated, panic, was a complete nause. Like I was, I was what, I, what I detest in other people. Yeah. And, and I was like a merble burbler. I was like, oh my God, you know, it's Martin Johnson, you know, started telling him that I was Mr. Massive Fan, Mr. Johnson. It was like oh, terrible, it was awkward. It still gives me like a cold sweat when you think about it now. But he was too loyal, and you had a whole set of people that couldn't communicate, didn't work as a team, didn't understand each other, didn't understand how to win, weren't as professional. And then when all the wheels fell off, he took the blame for it. And the problem was that he needed to have come in there and pick the best people and create an environment that was winning. And that's what he, that's what let him down. Nothing to do with anything else. Not to what happened with the World Cup or anything else. It was down to that specifically. He was too loyal to his old teammates and people, and he fucked himself because none of them were good enough to be at international level. He was good enough. But he should have got people in around him and knew what they were doing, picked the best and created it. I reckon he, w he would have created the dynasty. But, but, but that's, that's not, that could have been at that time naivety of a new coach because he had never coached before. So yeah. normally now, if, if say when I left Gloucester and um, Humphreys came in and I was coach, I was bats coach, 
if I was Humphreys coming in, I would get rid of all the coaches. Because at the end of the day, and it's the same with uh, sort of the stories you hear about... Um, uh, Eddie Jones? No, Stuart Lancaster. Stuart Lancaster. And Good. the fact that you know he had arguments with coaches and then he gave in to the coaches. Well, hang on. One thing that Clive would have done, he, he, even if he got outvoted 25 to 1, Clive would go, well, it's on, everything hangs on me. Yeah. So I appreciate your votes, but I'm picking what I want to do. I think with Jono, he came in, and I, agree, I actually do agree with Hask, that if he'd have gone, right, I need to find my own coaching staff, wipe it out. But he's, he's walked in, he's walked in as a, as a first-time coach and gone, right, I just need a, an environment I'm comfortable with. And that's not necessarily what you do. Because at the end of the day, if you are the, the top job, you are, the, the, the book doesn't pass b- beyond you. Right. So you need to make sure that you have had control over everything. So you bring in the people that you think will enhance your environment. Because then you can say, well, at least it was my decision. Yeah. And I think that's what Haskey's saying, is he sort of came in and Brian Smith had stayed on and, and these guys, whereas then if it all goes the same way, yeah. but it, it didn't, we started winning games. We only what, lost two no. games. We lost two games in, in 2011 and before Ireland that. And France. Yeah. And so, yeah, and obviously what went on in the World Cup, if we'd have won that game, it'd be different. But. Did John get banned from punching you? I completely made that up. Yeah, no, he did. 1997. We were both captains, actually. I met him in the tunnel and... It's like again, I was a bit like you, yeah. because I hadn't been that real that close to him before. He's so massive, isn't he? He's a big man, big, massive, horrible Leicester mute. Like yeah, <laughs> it's like looking at him, thinking, it's like looking at balls, something. I hope I don't go anywhere near. It's like in looking this at game. something from Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I thought Jamie, I thought Jamie Joseph didn't like backs, and then I stare at John and thinking, yeah. you really don't like backs, do was you? It, was it a proper clock as well, or was it sort of? Oh yeah, uh, it was about it's about twenty odd minutes into the game. I don't remember it. Right. But I've seen it since. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so it worked. I, 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 I cleared the ball competently for once. Yeah. And thought, oh, that's actually quite a good pass. Bam! Right there. <laughs> right in the back of the head. So you'd, you'd, yeah. had, you'd had a few games against him. I mean, was he... I mean, in English, rugby, obviously, is, is, is a hero. But was, yeah. he, was he a nuisance to play oh, against? Yeah. Hard. Yeah, he was. He was an absolute... But that's what good players are. They're a nuisance to play against. Yeah. Like, you, when you talk about players that are difficult and you find them, you know, on the field an absolute nightmare. It's because yeah. they're good at what they do, yeah. you know, like, and he didn't, again, he was a bloke that didn't die wondering at any breakdown, he carried hard. He's a good bit of a uh, sledger as well. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, well, very, yeah. Well, I told you the story about when, well, when I first played man. against him. No. And, and uh, so basically I played, I used to live with a guy called Russell Earnshaw who played England Sevens. Um, I lo- good love coach Russell. Now. He, uh, well, yes, he is. Yeah. But he's very airy fairy. He's perfect for this time. He's like, oh, yeah. anyone can play any position. No, they can't, Russell. What are you talking about? Anyway, sorry if you listen to this, Russell. We'll talk about it another yeah. time. Um, but I lived with him, and he and he was playing against Backy. And obviously, this was a big game because I thought, right, Russell was good enough to play for for England. And he was literally playing Backy off the park. And then Backy got a yellow card, and I was giving it bye 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 bye. I was literally nineteen. Bye. And then Jono turned around to me and Oi, nobody, shut the fuck up. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got no comeback to that. <laughs> it's Mackie Martin Johnson. I can't go, I, can't, I, I just can't come back to that. He slapped you in a bar, was it in Paris? Yes, in Paris, 99. Yeah. Was that the one that did that? Before well, you no, it, that? it was already quite It was already on its way. Did you ever get a, did you, have you got scars from Jono? No, he was, I think his biggest regret of his career. Was he, he didn't not, get, he, he he didn't get you to film me in. So what he used to do is, if I'd have a joke, he'd grab me by the front of my waterproof shirt, and he'd be like that, like partly joking, partly serious. He goes, if I played against you, I would have smashed your face off. Like, he, he was desperate to do it. <laughs> but obviously, being head coach, he couldn't, he couldn't get away with it. But it, he, it, like, it happened like once, happened twice. Happened probably about nine or ten times, and he's like, Hask, if I played against you, you fucking gobshot. What, what was he like? <laughs> just, what was he like though, at, like, mauling training? Oh, God. Right, so, so... You know, like, the, so most of the Leicester guys, they don't, they don't, like, Lewis Moody, John O, John Wells, Graham Rountree, they've either got on or off. They don't have, like, compassion button. So they don't have, like, understanding. Like, normally in a team sport, like, you know, if it's, like, a, a Thursday or Friday, you kind of just go easy because you want to play. <laughs> they would literally, John O would be nothing to do with anything, and he would turn up in full waterproofs, ankle-high boots, 22 mil studs, right, and he'd get a tackle shield out. And him, Wellesie, Graham Roundtree uh, would just come out of nowhere and smoke people with just, like, <laughs> hatred. 
fucking piling and John would be elbowing people like that. And it would just get so aggressive that you'd... I, I, honestly, one time I ran a ball carry into Graham Rouch once and I like, bounced him off and he like, tumbled back and I could see them all having a little meeting. <laughs> right. The next time I ran into them, they closed the space and tackle pads are like lethal if you close the space. My neck compressed. No There's nowhere to go. <laughs> My neck compressed like, a, like an accordion. I went... <laughs> like, out the back, like flat and everyone's like... Whoop, killed him. But um, the best thing was is that uh, Johnny would get like every now and then we'd join into a session, and uh, uh, he was playing on the side. I think Johnny wasn't starting. It was against Cip Cipriani, and Johnny did a quick twenty-two, kicked over the top of Crofty, and Johnny was like that, ran over, <laughs> jumped up high knee into Crofty's head, elbow Crofty, knocked him out, caught the ball with one hand, and was off down the side like Mr. Gil. That's Mr. Gilmore's jacket, like horrible, <laughs> like, like horrible, like bony knees, hobnail boots. <laughs> Fingers at right angles, like strapped on. Jono just fucking bending people. We're like, Jono, you're the head coach. <laughs> Crofty's like folded inside out, his head's on backwards. He's like in class. <laughs> Mate, they were horrible. Honestly, they were horrible people. They would fucking live for Tuesday sessions. Jamie, Jamie, <laughs> question. You know you're training very hard for MMA right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. If you were to stick Jono and his prime into a Bellator ring. Oh, race, hanging. Honestly. Like, remember I told you that John Wells is. He wouldn't be allowed. He wouldn't yeah, eye gouge. Yeah. John, like John, <laughs> remember I told you John Wells is from Leicester. His ultimate warm-up was the one where I held the ball and two of you tried to get it off me and you could break my fingers to get the ball <laughs> off me. Now, being at Wasps, right, we were like, if you came and had the ball, I'd be like, you can have it. Just have it, mate. Yeah. Have it. But at Leicester, they'd be holding it, fingers would be getting snapped off. They're like, right, that's great, great work, James. And I'm like, John! <laughs> like, that, they'd be like, that's a great warm-up. You're ready to play. I'm like, no, I'm not ready to go to A&E, you mad bastard. <laughs> right? But John and that, like, John, John and him would have loved that. They would have just been like late elbows, like, you know, like, they're kind of thing that, a bit like Bucko. They go into a breakdown, it'd be like a late elbow shot to the head. You'd be dazed, you'd tread on your leg, tread on your calf, use your face to get up, tread on you on the way out. So in a cage, John would just tear you apart. It'd just be <laughs> horrible. Because he's so, like, he was so knobbly. Like, by the end of his career, he, like, it was like watching... Bone a, like, spurs. Yeah, like. but yeah, it was like watching a, tr a traction engine. You know, like, you remember, like, a steam fair, where they get this old, like, traction engine that was yeah. like... It would take it out. John would start like walking, and by the end of the warp, he'd be running like high knees and ready to go with everything strapped on, the cute angles, just bone bits hanging out of everywhere. <coughs> it, it was horrific, mate, horrific. Who would be the Kiwi equivalent of that? <coughs> uh, in the modern day, no, because the, 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 ment the mental side of it's changed from, from yeah. those blokes, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but probably when I first came in, a guy called Richard Lowe. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he, he was a nasty, nasty piece of work, and he, he loved hurting people with training. Your, his own teammates he enjoyed right. that. Many, many a times I had a crack at him because he's been just a twat hurting yeah. his own teammates. Yeah. And he, he would chase me around the, the field. Like, yeah. I'd be going this side, and I could see, I could see him coming. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, what? right. But I knew he had such a great passing game. Then when yeah, he was yeah, chasing yeah. me around, never move the ball away from quick, the base right? so quick. Yeah. But it's like, it's like with Lewis Moody as well. You know, he he'd have like, he, he basically in training, what would happen is if you kick a ball up in the air. Oh more often than not, you would let the side who are underneath it catch the ball. Yeah. Not Lewis. Lewis on a kickoff on like a Tuesday afternoon would run like an Exocet missile. Just dive head first. And if he caught you, if he caught you, you're dead, right? You're literally dead. <laughs> but more often than not, he'd just go head first into your knee and knock himself out, and that'd be the end of his race. <laughs> he'd run in and just he'd run in and dive over the top and just got hit straight in the balls. You just this, <laughs> and he'd be like, and he'd be like on his floor. But he would just not have any any off button. So in the middle of a mall session, and no and no self awareness. No self awareness. But, he'd be, but what he would do is he's like he's, he'd get really upset. So what would happen is you get like a young player. We'd be going through a mall. It would just be like a mall setup. So mall setup is forwards. You know we're just practicing getting in people tight. But if there's any loose gaps, he'd come charging in, elbowing like that. He's not good enough. You're like Lewis, calm down. Fuck off. Trying to punch everyone. You're like. <laughs> And then he'd like actually miss and punch himself and knock himself out again. He'd be like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm not even fucking standards. You're like, you're not at less than now. Well, all of you just calm down. <laughs> just calm down. It was just like, I told, we told that story last week with Jeff Parling. Yeah. It got into him fired up when he punched me in the face because I went, this is a mole, it's a mole. They teach you that in the CIA. And he's like, man, man, what? And I was like, what are you doing? It's a fucking walkthrough. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem is that they get, they get, they get, people get real carried away. Like, I, I remember we had a, we had a, a a mall session with Coley. Like Coley once, we were in the middle of a mall and he Coley trod on my, trod on my foot. I was like doing it, so I trod on his foot and we were both 
on each other's foot, fully extending <laughs> through each other's foot. It's like this, looking at each other, trying to kill each other with this foot. And we're like, Corley, what are we doing? He's like, I don't know. I say, just leave the Leicester at home, bro. <laughs> Do you want to tell the story? Oh, well, yeah. We're well, we, can fit it, we can fit it. We'll do you fit it. Well, how long have we got left? Do, do we have to worry about legals or not? No, no, no. No, I don't think well, so. He hasn't, <laughs> he hasn't, he hasn't so, sued yet. No, so... Just well, talking uh, to people so. with fingers. Though. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know if there's uh, 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 some fans of the show in the room, but last week I talked about the guy that grabbed me by the cheeks, ruffled me, hit me. So on last week's live show, I walked off the stage and some bloke went, Hass, mate! And hit me right on the back of the neck. So, so I, I've now got a new pot. I'm not, that's not again, I don't, I'm not fighter, I don't do it particularly hard. This isn't, this isn't an audition for more people to be mental. Ironic, but I, the I fact said, that you are a I, yeah, now, but I, I am really actually, but on the confines of when I'm getting paid, not in the street. <laughs> um, and I said to this guy, and I, I literally lost my shit, so I said, listen, mate, I've fucking just done a show on this, please stop doing that. So, anyway, fast forward, I'm at a rugby, I won't mention any names, but I'm at, I'm at this lunch. I'm talking to this guy, and he's having photos of everyone, doing everything, like, trying to do my bit. And he's come over and he's given me a bit of chat about my lid, right? And this bloke had a forehead that started back here. It wasn't a forehead. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was a six head. Do you know what I mean? Honestly, I, if I was a company, I would have sponsored it. That amount of billboard space was incredible. So, so he, start, he, he starts coming, coming at me, so I shut him down like Woolworths. Got him in, got him, you know, got into him a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, so, he, so he's, he not, he's not, he's not having, he's, he's not he's not having it. And he had, a real, he had a real big mate with him. It was a real weird bloke. It was like a little and large setup. So, so they were getting a little bit aggro. Obviously, I'm a real kind of posh high-end high end dinner. So I'm like, I'm like, you know, don't want to cause a scene. So I just said to him, listen, mate, just, just relax. So I've turned around and a photo with this, like, the chairman of this club and this other bloke. And this bloke has licked his finger Aww. and really stuffed it in my ear. Ooh. So, so I, honestly, Ooh, I have fucking lost my mind. I've turned around, picked this guy up by the throat. He's like dusted, slipped off the thing, been carried out. I've obviously turned around thinking that this is okay, I've lost my head. Everyone's like this. <laughs> like, middle class rugby England. <laughs> you know what, the best, I told my coaches about it, and they were like, oh my God, you got penetrated, bro. And I was like, <laughs> I physically got penetrated. So I've now got a new policy now. I am fuck, I fucking had enough of this now. And this is a line of sound. So, any rugby event, anyone, anyone steps over the mark, you're fucking getting it, and I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> because I still got paid, so that's the end of the day, you know. <laughs> if people stop paying me, then I might be a little bit nicer, but anyway. But that's, how, how unacceptable is that, though? Legitimately. Like, you can't... I know people for years, and I wouldn't lick my finger and stick it in their fucking ear. <laughs> Mad, isn't it? Like, what? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, no, well, it's all right. I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't mind that. I'd find it funny, but like, haha, good for the podcast. I'd run you over the car later. <laughs> I'd wait until you're asleep later, and I just fucking put a pillow on you. Tins, are, unfortunately, tins have slept away in the night. It's very, it's very sad case of it. <laughs> Welcome, Joe Marla today. <laughs> 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 I think, I think, don't penetrate the hask is a new yeah, t-shirt. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I've got to say. I'll wear it. Please don't penetrate the hask. And on that note, somewhere we've got a plug for our t-shirts and exclusive range of House of Rugby merchandise. That no one's seen yet, is it? Go to shop.joe.co.uk. Shop.joe.co.uk. We need don't penetrate hask and fuck fucko in the... Uh, yeah. uh, Marshy, would you like a t-shirt of any... You don't, you don't know what we're talking about. We'll we've got, we've got t-shirts t -shirts and quite, it's quite yeah. good, yeah. Uh, some what, good what merch. We'll, we'll, get a we'll get a bunfer. We'll yeah. get a bunfer t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about, what about the swimming one? Where, where, oh, I think that's fuck. a great story. Can you tell that? Can you tell that? I think that's quite a good story to tell. No, uh, we were just oh, talking about it. So, uh, Oni and Bolshoi are stag. Marshy obviously played with Bolshoi at uh, Leeds. And Mar uh, to say that Marshy is competitive is a, a, an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> um, th there is a story about the champ, um, which gets him riled up. But <laughs> yeah. he can tell that at no time. But we're on. We went to a place in Vegas. Bolshoi Stag was in Vegas. Quality and, uh, destination for a stag. And oh. we were in Tau Day at the time. And we've walked out, and I don't know how, we've ended up talking to this uh, wife and her family. Like, her kids are there. Her kids are with her. And uh, Mar I don't know how it happened, but Marshy's basically ended up having a swimming, a swimming race against this woman. <laughs> and now, this, to be fair to this woman, she, she would have been uh, late 30s, 40s. She got a lot, I'm pretty good at swimming. I used to swim for, like, I used to swim whatever they call stage. it, varsity or stage state or whatever. And Marshy's like, yeah, I can beat you. <laughs> so anyway, are you a good swimmer? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> so, all back. At, like the, at, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. at this point, they get they get in the pool, and I'm like, and I've gone to Paul. Should Marshy swim? And he's like, I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, off they go. It's, it must have been a 15, 20 meter pool. Two lengths. Girls come back 10, 10 meters in front of Marshy, <laughs> right? And Marshy's got to the end. He goes, Oh, I got my tumble turn wrong. We need to go again. <laughs> <laughs> And we're like, Marsh, it's not the fucking tumble to the <laughs> Anyway, he went again and got beaten by 20 metres. He was like halfway. And uh, he was like, fuck, we need to go again. Yeah. And like, Mark, we literally were dragging him out of the pool going, look, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that we sport your family day out. <laughs> can, we, can we go? It's because you're walking back through the holiday. Kids thing. are crying. Shut the fuck <laughs> up, <laughs> kids. <laughs> Shut up. Your mum's about to get beat, you fucking old weasel. All right, you literally, should get that. Like, go again. Justin Marshall, going again. Yeah, yeah. literally, go again. all go the way again. back. Let's go again. Let's yeah. go, go again. again. Back so, Marshy's would be, Marshy said, let's go again. Yeah. yeah. Well, Marshy, go again. We've got, what was your one? Uh, don't penetrate that. Don't penetrate that. Fuck, bucko. And what does Zoe know about horses? <laughs> yeah. 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 What does Zoe know about horses? Well remembered, or did so si remember that? No, it won't. Honestly, yeah, cool. Yeah, he He's just woken up to, to let us know that the jet yeah. lag is working yeah. off. Um, perfect pool? Do it. Perfect pool, do, do it. Um, can you think of anything other than pick up? Nah. No, okay, right. We've got to do one bit of rugby thing at the World one Cup. One bit of rugby chat. We're going to pick our bit, best 15 from the quarter finalists. So our loose head rugby. Uh, um, quickly, the spiel is our weekly test in 119 and a half seconds. This is the perfect pool because that's how long it takes to pour the perfect point of Guinness. You know your ruggers, so we're going to come to you because very little, a little bit. Actually, you know more than most. Um, <laughs> let's pick our best 15 from the remaining quarter finalists. So your loose head would be, from what we've seen in the pool stages, who would get your loose head shirt if you're picking up the best 15 yeah. from our last day? Yeah. Have I made any, has that made any sense? What numbers are loose head where? So Hassel, <laughs> Hassel leans in at this point no, to look really keen I'm because he's not entirely sure what the detail is. Nakajima. Nakajima? Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's excellent. Very good. Would anyone trump Nakajima from the pool no. stages as your loose head? I have Nakajima. Also. Joe Marla? I've got Nakajima as well. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> of course you have, but no, no. <laughs> Nakajima wins on this session. You're going to have a lot of what I say. Who's the hooker? Latu. Uh, good. OK, I'll, I did have Latu, but I'll go... The Japan hooker has been outstanding. I can't remember his name, but... Shota Hari. Shota Hari. Good. Casting vote. Yeah, same. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Marcy. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, tight head. Kits off. Kits off. Yay, Kits, Kits off. off. Oh, we got a we got a bocker here. Yeah, we have. Yeah. We got we got a couple of bockers. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean I moved Joe Marla to three, so <laughs> I put Marla in Is there. Is that lack of knowledge or just running out of prop options? No, I just felt that he could. We love it, Joe. Yeah, we love Joe. I felt like he could do a cross. He's a friend of the show. Yeah. And, and in my world, anyone could do anything. Tight head Why not I just pick props. Pardon? him? Why not stick him with Ted? Because he's shit at pen. Right, okay. He'd be, no, he'd be good. He, he doesn't. He, he, no, remember, he was the cover. He was the secret weapon. Okay. Remember that? Tighthead? It does feel long and tight. He is, doesn't he? Yeah. Tad. 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 Tad is our Tad. A friend of the Tad. show and a good Tad. Yeah. yeah, I'm Tidge. going on. Tige Ty, Ty Furlong. Yeah. Marsh, I'm going to go with you, Tige Furlong. I'm not sure Joe Marler can play tighthead. Well, I think you finally can, actually. And in my world, we can. All right, so. I'm not sure he's the best tighthead in the world right now from the quarterfinals. No, but I think no, he does a very good job. You have to, so. Also, this is going on performances that have been so yeah. far. But yeah. some not any tighthead in this Well, he doesn't need to. He's fucking done well at the other one. We want Nakajima in there. So, you know, uh, okay. it's not the you. Joe Marler on the tighthead. Second in, yeah. rose, pick two. Uh, yeah, Maro. Maro and uh, Mozart. 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 That's the one. Mozart. Or Mozart. 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 Mozart's very good. good. Yeah. The does a lot of this. Century Baroque musical music. <coughs> he was unbelievable. New movement. I've got Burn and Mostart. I burn. Oh. Yeah. Is Mostart like Mozart, but not quite as good? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. Oh, this is my. Yeah. Marshy, anyone that you'd like to contribute to the second row debate? No, I'm happy with that. I'm Maro like. Maro. Yeah. Maro, Mozart. Tyke Burn. And Mozart. And Good, I'm glad we've prepped this nicely. Yeah. Um, Bat Rowers, anyone that you'd like to contribute? Sam Underhill, I think it's been bloody fantastic. Yay! Yay! I thought he was... Finally, uh, finally the is fine. I thought he's been carrying uh, really well. He's added an extra dimension to his game, and I thought he was unlucky not to get man of the match in the last game. And I don't even like Bat Row that could have been competition, but now I've retired, I'm happy to back him. Happy for Sam. But if I was so still playing, I'd side. shoot him in the head in the car park. Ardy? <laughs> yeah, Ardy, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I you, feel like you, you don't know anything about it. I feel like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well onto how some rugby is. I'll go the other two then. I'll do for both the Japanese players, Leach and the the number eight. Yeah. Lapis well, I actually, I actually had uh, Michael Leach at six. I had Michael Leach at six. I had Underhill at seven. And who at seven? Underhill at seven. Okay. Michael Leach at six. I, my back row is Leach at six, Underhill at seven, and Jimeno at eight. Jimeno at eight. I had yeah. a Dwayne, Dwayne Vermeulen at eight. Apparently, he's a very good player. No, I know exactly who he is. I'm joking. I'm joking. He's bloody good. Anyone like to contribute? We're just happy with Jimeno and. Yep. Yeah. Nine. Nine. Who's your nine? Oh, golly. Magic, what's your back three, man? No, wait. Wait, wait mate. Wait. Honestly, this isn't an wait. interactive show. We yeah. fucking yeah. told you. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> well, your one job is to shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know no, no, you're, you're doing it again. Shut up and listen. <laughs> can you pick us a nine? No, I can't. No, good moment. stuff. Thank you for that. I can. Aaron Smith. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Gareth Davies. Good. Ten. Uh, Who gets a big game? Tamura. To you, Tamura. You, Tamura. Yeah. Uh, I just had Japanese. At <laughs> <laughs> this is where it unravels. You unstitch no, it. I know. Making friends as we come. No, I'm just saying the Japanese number yeah. 10. You, Tamura, for you? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. you, Tamura, yeah. for yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go centres? Let's do centre combination. Um, I've gone Nakamura at yeah. 12. And then I've gone Ringrose. Okay, okay. Ringrose. I've gone Jonathan. Nice nod to Ireland. A little cheer yeah. for tens of hours. Come on, one Irishman. Note to all Irish, give him the fucking ball. Yeah, I've got uh, Jonathan Davis, incredible player, great offload to score that Looks try Looks like he's going to be fit as well. And I yeah. had uh, Manu because I thought he's been a one-man wrecking ball. Yes. Good rugby cliche there. Yeah. Someone's been reading the Tech yeah. rugby report. I have, I have. Uh, yeah. yes. I'm going to go Anton Leonard Brown. Yeah. And I'll go for Karivi. Good, yeah. nice nod. He's never a, a penalty. Used a lot. Used a lot. Yeah, he Used is a, lot. a workhorse. Yeah. Uh, back three. Uh, Matsu at 14. Right. Uh, <laughs> Hayley Petty at 11. Who? Who? The fast one Matsushima. from Japan, Matsushima. Matsushima. Yeah, not Matsu. Matsu. Oh, well, if you, don't, if you don't know him well enough to call him Matsu, that's awkward, bro. I know, yeah, yeah. I know. I'm really good friends with him, so I can call him Matsu. But Matsushima, that's right. absolutely fine if you want to go yeah. official. Uh, Hayley Petty, Curtly Beal. He's very good. How much of the pool stages have you watched, just out of interest? Quite a lot, actually. <laughs> well, no, genuinely, because in the Maldives, I, I was forced to. No, I was. I was forced to. But I was sitting down there, they were feeding me champagne and, and uh, you know, hors d'oeuvres, throwing yeah. it at me. Well, eat this, eat this caviar. I was like, I don't want any more. Um, I was watching a lot of it, yeah. Good. It was honestly it was high pressure. Uh, I have gone um, Bowden at 15, just yeah. because of how well he played against South Africa. Literally, he, was, he just pulls defences apart. I've gone. Uh, Kobe, uh, Colby at Cheslin. Cheslin, Cheslin. Colby. He wears but a, a special cap, mention to Fukuoka. Fukuoka? Is it Fukuoka? And then at 11, I have gone Josh Adams, but a, I have given the shout out to. This is where we talk about balance. Even though I abuse Wales and abuse Ireland, I still, if they play well, uh, Matsushima has got a special mention because. Not Matsu, don't know him well Matsushima. enough. Yeah. yeah. Japanese? Yeah. So why are you talking about Wales and Ireland? No, no, because I picked Josh Adams. Josh, 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 Josh Ashams. Josh Ashams. Um, hey, everyone, you shink, Josh. <laughs> yeah. um, I have picked Josh Adams, but a shout out to Max. That is the worst Shana. perfect pool we have done in 20. <laughs> oh, I'm amazed you years. haven't actually contributed. No, I, there's whatsoever. absolutely nowhere to go off the back of that. I'm not sure any of the names are actually mm. Hayley Petty and. Uh, yeah. Kiki. <laughs> no, no, but I'm making it, it more accessible. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let's finish with prediction. Ireland, New Zealand. Uh, winner by how many? Uh, well, New, Zeal New Zealand. New Zealand by 12. Ooh, bold. Ireland by five. Wow. Yeah. You can't, you can't. New Zealand back. by 84. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, no, New Zealand by uh, more than 12. Really? Yeah. England, Australia? England by not many. England by seven. Strong. England by seven. England by 10. England by 10. Wales, France. Wales by 15. Yeah. Wales by 18. Wait, 18 and a half. Can you get half a run? <laughs> it's a joke, you fucking kid. Wales, Wales by five. <laughs> Wales by five. Ooh. Uh, five. Japan, South Africa. Oh. Head and heart. Head. Japan by three. And that's head. Yeah. And heart. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think they, they, I think they can do it. Head and heart, Japan. Head and heart. Japan by one. Head and heart. Yeah. And South Africa by five. Yay. Don't want, I don't want it to be. I want it to be proved wrong, but... Quick, quick straw poll in here. Cheer for South Africa. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's Elmer. Who's going to yeah. be on the for tomorrow? Cheer for Japan. Yeah! <laughs> We're all Japanese this weekend, aren't we? Thank you to our wonderful audience here in Tokyo. Yeah! That works, doesn't it? Uh, don't forget to join our House of Rugby Facebook group if you haven't already. There are thousands of you on there. Please do come and join the party. You can buy T-shirts for our exclusive range of House of Rugby merchandise. We've got new ones coming every week. Uh, Shop.joe.co.uk. Thank you to Mike. Thank you to James. A special thank you to Marshy for coming tonight. Big cheer for them. Thanks, We've got a live show coming out tomorrow. We've got another live show back here next week at 7 o'clock. Enjoy whatever is to come uh, in the quarterfinal weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun, whichever way you cut it. We've got a preview pod tomorrow. Producer side just reinforcing that. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again very soon. A big cheer once again to all our friends here at Peter Cole. Have a very good rest of your evening. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe. Together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.